Our, by the way, we do have one more drawing left. I just need to put that out, so you want to hang around. Uh, our next speaker is Jeffrey Pence, who is the HIPAA Security Officer for the University Health Center at the University of Georgia. Did I get that right? Okay, and he's gonna to speak to us about a network security plan. Very interesting uh, biography again, so do uh, go take a look at his bio online. I believe that you started your career with a Bachelor of Science in Timber Management. That's right. And you ended up I learned as to write, a HIPAA. I learned to write programs in Fortran on key punch cards. Oh, I'm that old. Awesome. I. Okay, Boomer, I'm I got paper now. I was a TA in Fortran, wow. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. I'm really uh, flattered to be here, and I uh, wasn't expecting this at all. But uh, I decided that rising to the occasion was good, and getting in front of some people that I don't know is not a bad thing. Uh, I actually went to high school in Warner Robins about 120 years ago, and uh, my only claim to fame is that I was in high school with Jake Fromm's great uncle. So that and about three dollars will get me a cup of coffee. All right, I got I got a couple of things here. I'm I'm going to start with one talking about that Equifax breach and people, uh, you know, everybody in this room has probably been affected. Best thing I know to do is put a freeze on every one of your credit uh, accounts with Equifax and the other two agencies, and that way folks can't take out loans in your name. They can't steal your identity, is easily. And, uh, but it's a pain in the butt so that when you go and get a switch over to T-Mobile, they're gonna wanna do a credit check, you're gonna have to remove the freeze, but it makes it a whole lot harder for people to steal your uh, financial information. Um, second thing, why was a guy like me turn out to be an IT guy? In 1977, how many people were not even alive in 77, okay? I bought a TI-55 32-step programmable calculator. Oh, whoopee, 32-step. I was so proud that I put the quadratic equation in it, and I put in the values for A, B, and C, and solved for X, and just freaked out. I was down at ABAC in Tifton, where all the North Florida cowboys go to school. And I went home, and I showed my father, who was a retired Air Force pilot, full bird colonel, after 30 years. And I said, and he was a, a loan officer at a savings and loan at the time. I said, look, Dad, I got this calculator, and I put in the quadratic equation, and it gives me the answer. And he looks at me, and he goes, son, I don't know what the quadratic equation is. Can it calculate payments on a loan? And I said, I don't know. I said, you got a formula? If it's 32 steps or less, maybe. So he goes and gets his financial book that they're using he had been using a calculator to do all this math. If you've ever done any financial calculators from scratch, financial calculations from scratch, it's not easy. And I wrote the formula, and he says, uh, I said, okay, how much money are we borrowing? Keyed it in, hit the letter A. I said, how many years are we making payments? Keyed it in, hit the letter B. And he said, uh, let's see, uh, interest rate. What's the interest rate? keyed that in, hit the letter C, typed a zero, hit X, and it gave us a number, and I looked at it, and I went. He goes and gets his financial tables book, interest rates across the top, years down the side, amount of money you borrowed, and, he goes, and this is what he had to do anytime someone came in for a loan. To the penny. He freaks out, he looks at me, and he goes, damn, son. He goes out to the base, he buys TI-99 calculators, you know what's so cool about those, 300 steps, magnetic card reader, now he can write programs, put them on a card, give you the calculator, give you the card, and you can do the financial calculations too, simply by knowing what goes at A, B, C, and solving for D. Well, that was pretty cool. My dad was about a year away from losing his VA benefits, he'd been retired that long, he enrolled at Macon Junior College, this institution, not this physical one, Macon Junior College. He got an associate's degree in business and he got a minor in computers and at the age of 19, my dad and I bonded. 
I was a long-haired hippie kid in high school. He was an Air Force colonel pilot as much as we could. From that point on, we had a relationship that lasted until he passed away. And I just would never trade that for anything. So I had this calculator that would shortcut calculations and give me answers. And I just thought it was so cool. Well, then I go from ABAC to University of Georgia, the forestry school. So I'm in my third year of school. They hand you a schedule. You don't get to pick your schedule anymore. And the first class I had was Fortran in a, in a statistics class and I'm writing on key punch cards. And I'm in the grad studies building at the University of Georgia in the basement at 2 in the morning going, why is this not, it's not? And this guy takes my, my green bar paper. If I'm using terms you're unfamiliar with, it's OK. And he goes, oh, you left a semicolon out right here. I'm sure you've never done that, right? Semicolon, colon, comma, space, all that kind of stuff. So I learned how to program there. Now, I was, at that point, I'm like 20, 21 years old. My logic brain is still girl. You know, I didn't have that logic brain. I got a C. Freaked me out. First one I'd ever got in my life. And uh, then we used it in about 80% of our classes. And we learned a technique called linear program modeling. Have you ever done multiple linear equations? You're solving for the same variables, right? And you use this Gauss-Jordan reduction technique. Whew, God almighty. A girl, all right, a girl in forestry school, that's like, you know, that, that young lady that was over here, you know, one of a million at Georgia Tech. She raises her hand and asks the teacher, is there a book where we can figure out what in the world you're talking about? So we learn how to use this process. I go, this is great. I'll never use it. I graduate. I start in the woods. And because I knew how to use a computer, I sat down at a TI, uh, no, a TRS-80 Model uh, 3 with a 500K hard drive and started writing programs in BASIC to calculate the information that came out of the field and turn that into how much standing timber you have now, how much standing timber you're going to have in five years, in 10 years, and then what if you harvest it, and then how much standing timber do you have in in 15 years, what rate of return are you looking for? And once it reaches this minimum, sell. And we're going to these uh, landowners. I was working in private forestry. There's a company that's still here. I was working out of Jeffersonville, Georgia. And I was just loving it. I'm writing programs, doing all this kind of stuff, just really cool. And I never, ever, ever thought I'd be doing that when I grabbed that TI-55 calculator. So I stayed in forestry for a couple of years. I then ended up working in a um, computer store, learned how to connect computers of different types together, and move data, and all this fun stuff. So that was, that was all great. And I learned a lot. And what I'm really getting at at this point is I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't known the people I knew then that taught me how to do things I never thought I would be able to use or do or be interested in. So what you're doing here as a student is possibly not what you're going to do in 15 years, but it's definitely going to be a great foundation to get you where you're going to be in 15 years. So good stuff. All right, a lot of people that I want to thank. All right, if you are going to, if you're going to secure a network or digital assets, you have to know the rules of the game. And the way you know the rules of the game is you have to understand your environment. Do you have, uh, do you work in a regulated industry? If you work in a regulated industry, then you have to figure out what kind of regulations do I have to comply with? To figure out what kind of regulations you have to comply with, you have to go, what kind of data do I have? Financial, HIPAA, uh, help for health records, financial, PCI, you may have, um, Educational records, so you got FERPA. So you've got all these kind of regulations that are out there. And um, you'll probably 
then have to categorize your data as to whether or not it's public, it's private, it's restricted, it's sensitive, and each of those types of data needs certain types of protection so that you can, one, stay out of the paper, two, maintain the trust of your clients, and three, stay in business, right? So if you lose your data, you lose the trust of your clients, you may very well lose your business. So if you're trying to figure out how do I protect this stuff, there's a lot of resources out there that if you look at a federal regulation, they're usually pretty broad. They're not very prescriptive. They tell you, oh, you got to protect that. You got to do this, and you got to protect that. But they don't tell you how. So if you find out what kind of data you got, then you know what kind of regulations you got to target. And then you can go, well, I want to go to the NIST. You've heard uh, a couple of times today. You want to go to ITIL. You want to go to some other places and find handbooks, best practices, guides on what you need to do for this type of data. Now, um, the other thing you really have to have is you've got to have really smart people that you can tap. And they may be a vendor, they may be a network administrator, systems administrator, database administrator, uh, security systems administrator. If you work in a big enough shop, the network guys are different than the server guys, and they're different than the operating system uh, gals, and they're different than the database people. I work in a smaller shop. There's about six of us. And so everybody's got to pretty well know what the other one does. But they also have to be pretty specialized so that when something's on fire, you throw John at this fire because he's the fastest one that can put it out, right? So you've got to have, to have uh, the expertise. Now, I grew up when there weren't certifications. There really weren't schools for this kind of stuff. It was all seat of the pants. And um, you just kind of had to live and learn. I opened my own business, ran it for about 15 years, and it was one of the best things I ever did simply because I got questions I never would have thought of. How do you do this in Excel? I don't know. Uh, we're paying you. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, no problem. I'll figure that out. So if you have expertise in one person, that's great. At one point, I had one systems administrator, and he did almost everything, and we had a uh, client support guy. But as things grew and things got more complicated, and as I went further out of the technical aspects of it, more into the management and bureaucracy aspects of it, my skills kind of atrophied. And so I'd have to find more people. And then I would have to have people that I trusted. And so I would have to um, either tap friends or tap vendors or consultants or hire, right? I work at the University of Georgia. And um, so we can't pay a lot of money. There's a lot of smart people there. There's a nice computer science department there, there's public health there, all kinds of things uh, where you can learn. But what you really have to have is someone you can call either in the middle of the night when it goes wrong or when um, when you have people standing in line, right? So because I work in healthcare, we're highly regulated by HIPAA and the High Tech Act. Well, because I work at a state university, we're highly regulated when it comes to FERPA. And now you sit here and go, wait a minute, is my student health record covered by HIPAA or FERPA? Ask a lawyer that question. I have several times. Um, so what happens is you look at these regulations and they give you some guidance. For example, the HIPAA security rule requires that you have these different kinds of safeguards. And the safeguards are in these broad categories. And that could be administrative or technical or physical. So you have to be able to protect this data in multiple ways. Administrative is basically policies and procedures. Do you have a network disaster plan? Do you have a backup plan? Have you tested that? Do you have policy and procedures for what kind of information somebody can access? Do you have a training program that every person that works there goes through every year 
and signs an affidavit that says, I read them, I understand them, I'll abide by them. I understand the consequences if I don't. If you don't have that, you're going to have a harder time letting someone go when they did something they shouldn't have done. Because you can't point, you signed this affidavit three years in a row. You've been not following the policy. We've warned you. We've counseled you. And now it's time to go. I'm going to grab my water. Oh, even better. So the administrative safeguards you see here, background checks, those are really important. You know you do a background check on somebody today, they get arrested tomorrow, you never do another background check. You might think about doing background checks a little more frequently. Because, um, you know, if somebody gets arrested by the GBI for cyber crimes or for child molestation, they're not going to be showing up for work for a while. And, you know, they could just call and say, I'm out sick. And I'm out sick for this many days. And I got out of jail and I came back to work. And you didn't know any of it. So background checks are really important because you got to trust your staff. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify, right? So I trust this guy I just hired. I did a background check. I verified that he was not trustworthy. I didn't hire him. Okay. Oh yeah, like I said, I'm the, I'm the old guy and I'm gonna be using this okay boomer method of looking at my slides. All right, so you've got administrative background uh, or administrative safeguards. One of the other types of safeguards are gonna be physical. How do you keep people out of the building? How do you keep people out of Mary's office? How do you keep people off of this computer? How do you keep someone from stealing that computer? And um, how, what do you do in case of a natural disaster and your building just got knocked down? So you've got to have uh, physical safeguards that you're protecting your data and you're protecting your systems. We also have technical safeguards, and this is where I spend most of my time because these, to me, are the things that are really kind of fun, right? The, the main reason those of you are in uh, MIS classes or IT classes is because you really enjoy working with computers, making them work, making them hum, finding stuff in data. And so this is where I spend a lot of my time. But like I said, I'm in administration, so my IT team is a lot better on this stuff than I am. So if I were going to look at technical safeguards, obviously you want firewalls, and if you have next generation firewalls, they have a lot of features like intrusion detection and prevention, anti-malware, maybe content filtering, maybe you're blocking certain types of files and files extensions from coming onto your network, maybe you're blocking the majority of the outside world, which is something that we do. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is a lot of your ransomware and malware is going to phone home. It's going to show up on your network encrypted. It's going to execute and say, I want to go out here and get the keys so I can unlock this package and install it because your scanner missed that encrypted file coming in because it was encrypted uh, web traffic. And so you may need to do geo blocking or IP address blocking or IP range blocking. Uh, you can find resources for that. The FBI tells you, you know, you might want to be blocking these ranges. So we put that kind of stuff into a firewall. Uh, you also have to have your ability to uh, control your network. Uh, I remember I was so happy when we got the ability to disable a port when you plugged your computer into a port in our building. And we'd get an alert that said, hey, port so-and-so has just been disabled, an unknown device connected to it. So how many of y'all know about Raspberry Pis, everybody? How many of y'all have a Raspberry Pi? You heard a lady this morning talking about Kali Linux. You can make a little box about this big, got Kali Linux on it, everything's automated, you can walk by a port, plug that thing in. 
And by the time you walk out of the building, you're starting to get records and reports and stuff like that. If you've got network access control on the ports, that thing will trigger a net network access control block and disable the port. Now, a lot of places will automatically re-enable things. Like, you know, you got locked out because you keyed your password in seven or eight times. And then 30 minutes later, it'll just be ready for you to log in again. We're in a real controlled environment. I've at least got two people on staff at all times. So if someone disables a port or locks their account, there ain't no automatic to it. We get a notice, and we react to it. So we look at that notice, and we either re-enable a port because we know our client support guy was putting a new computer in an office, and he triggered it, or we found out there's a Raspberry Pi plugged into a port somewhere. Firewalls are great. First one I put in. Uh, within two days, this is during the summer, we were getting about 12,000 intrusion attempts a day. Now that's real broad. That's everything from a port scan to IP range scanning to even more, you know, we know you're here and so we're doing this. And that was during the summer and I was going, oh man, that's a lot. Well, the students came back and they brought their notebooks with them. And they went into the dorms and they plugged them in and connected to Wi-Fi. Intrusion attempts went to half a million a day. Stayed that way for three solid months. You have no idea how many abuse at UGA messages I wrote. <laughs> I automated that script. <laughs> so the thing that was interesting is we didn't have a firewall when I got there. We didn't know what we were missing. And then we got a firewall, and then we knew, and then the student showed up, and then we really knew. Some of you won't get this reference. There was a comic strip called Pogo, and there's a particular scene in there where Pogo goes, we have met the enemy, and he is us. And what I meant by that is, here I am, a UJ employee, and we got all these UJ students, and their machines were either purposefully, or they may have been compromised and just doing this stuff automatically, scanning our network. So we worked with the enterprise people to basically limit traffic, identify where things were happening, and so it was great. They helped us block some of that stuff and fix some things. Uh, patch management, vulnerability scanning, those two go hand in hand. You run vulnerability scanners, there's lots of open source stuff for this, uh, and you look at what you're vulnerable for. You might have to patch some things. You also look at um, what kind of events are occurring on the network, and you try to correlate those with what your vulnerabilities are and determine how serious this particular action is on your environment. And if you have some uh, automated capabilities to shut those kinds of activities down, turn off ports, et cetera, those things come in very valuable. They can speed your response to an event to near instantaneous when your person that might have been watching that screen was in the bathroom, right? So there's all kinds of tools out there. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're getting to the point these days where two-factor authentication is being, uh, you're, you're able to kind of get around two-factor authentication in, in some instances. So what the young lady was talking about this morning with three-factor authentication is probably coming fairly soon. All of that's great until you can get in behind that and just simply set the trigger that says, oh, we already saw the face and it matched. Because really, what's behind looking at someone's face and matching the picture? There's a checkbox that gets checked that says, compliant, move on. Getting around those tests and providing the information so that you get past that test is, is a particular issue that you may have to address. I was talking about uh, security events and information management. There's also these things called SIEMs, S-I-E-M. Those are the pieces that kind of correlate the two. They do vulnerability scanning, they look at the events, they give you the alerts, tell you what to do. So SIMs are good things. There are some that are open source. 
There's plenty of uh, vulnerability assessment tools. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of start uh, in a section of the network and work my way out to the customer. So I'm going to start in the data center and at the internet. And so basically, a, the internet is where all the bad guys are, except for the ones that work in your building, right? So you typically are going to be coming in through a firewall. If you have two firewalls and they're set up in a high availability mode and one fails, you can continue to work. That's good. That's expensive. That requires talent that knows how to set it up, knows how to configure it properly, make it work. You got to test it. You got to pull the plug. A couple of my guys just love to be the one to pull the plug. Can I pull it? Can I pull it? Can I pull it? Pull? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And the network cable goes out, and people just keep on going. So <clears throat> basically, you're going to have some sort of high availability firewall environment. We recently rolled out Pi-hole which is a DNS sync, which eliminated about 98% of all advertising showing up on web pages that our staff were browsing. And you go, wait a minute, 300 employees, 155,000 visits a year, and you're using a Raspberry Pi running Pi hole to do DNS sync hole? Yeah. Put them up in parallel. They work great, handle all that uh, DNS requests, drops off all the tracking, Works fantastic, didn't cost a dime, a couple of Raspberry Pis. I got a student worker, he went to a maker station, and he made some 3D cases for him. I mean, it's, it's great working with these people. I'm 61 years old, this guy's like 20 something, and he's making these little boxes for a computer. It's, it's just crazy stuff. I never thought I'd see it. All right, you also have to segment your, leg, your network. So typically you're gonna use a virtual local area network for that, and that gives you the ability to segment traffic. So the business services can talk to business services and business service, service servers. The pharmacy people can talk to the pharmacy server, but they can't talk to the business services computers. They can't talk to the business service uh, servers. So virtual uh, local area networks, virtual LANs, uh, give you the ability to segment and separate your traffic. You don't want I-285 and I-75 and I-85 traffic all running together and trying to get where they're going, right? That's why you have separate lanes and highways. At the core of your network, you're going to have uh, at least two high availability switches. And what we do in this environment is we redundant everything. Every firewall, every switch, every server has two power supplies in it. Every power supply is plugged into a separate UPS. So if one fails, the other is going to pick it up. Every UPS has the ability to run everything plugged into it for 10 minutes. Every UPS has two power supplies in it plugged into two different electrical emergency circuits. We have a generator that takes eight seconds to power up when mains cuts. The UPSs carry everything for that entire period. We're on uh, UPS power, we're running fine, and life goes on. Same thing for the edge switches. All of our connections from servers to switches are duplicated or quadruplicated. We have storage arrays. These guys all have multiple connections to the core and to the servers. And uh, we virtualize everything. We, I, when I started there, we had 13 servers. Within a year or two, we had 27 servers. And then within about six years, well, about eight years later, we're down to three servers. And that's running 45, that's physical servers, running 45 virtual servers. We can move them while, patient, while, while people are entering data. People don't know. We also have a remote data center, and we're lucky enough to have unbroken fiber between point A and point B. So this is actually on our network, different VLAN, and it's got less powerful servers, switches in HA, two of them, and it's got less expensive storage. But if our building got knocked down and we could reconnect here and we could set boxes down, everything comes right up. The most information we would lose would be five minutes which is really nice, because we've lost a lot of data before. You have a staff network, and this is a single box, but each one of these may be on a different VLAN. We have virtual systems in exam rooms. I'm the guy that went to the University Health Center 
And remember what the person was talking about where I went to my doctor and my doctor was doing this the whole time. That was one of the first things our doctors and nurses said is, I do not want this computer to be in the way. So we had tables designed, so the computer's here, the patient's there, they're right within eyesight. We had people design the templates in our EHR so that the least amount of time was spent on the computer screen in the exam room, and that any type of documentation that needed to happen later could be done pretty quickly. So very, people were kind of happy. First of all, we put computers in, they were really mad. We had two people retire because they couldn't type. Remember the story about taking the, I have 39 seconds. I can talk a lot faster. All right, so basically, you want to have your traffic segmented. You want to have redundancy. We have a private wireless network that uh, SSIDs that you can't see, you can't find, sniff type of stuff. And we want to be able to do clinical work on there. We don't allow people's private um, equipment to connect to that. This is the overall picture. We also control people's phones because they have access to our systems. If they're running Teams or they're running Outlook, we might want to wipe their phone if it starts doing bad things or they lose it. So imagine your personal telephone getting wiped by the IT department. There would be some happy people, right? So, that's just kind of the stuff that we had to do over most of this occurred within about a seven year period. Half of the technology we run didn't even exist when I started my job at the health center. So this moves real fast. You got to train your people. You got to trust your people. You got to verify they're worth trusting. You got to test your systems and you've got to be able to verify that your systems are working, right? And if you try to eat an elephant in one bite, this is what you get. But if you start from the outside and work your way in, and start from the inside and work your way out, then you can identify your weak places. What's the two most weakest things you've got in your enterprise? People and their smartphone. Go to a UGA game one day and see how many QR codes are sitting around the, uh, the parking lots before you go to the game. Would you like a chance to win a free jersey? <laughs> how many of those are legit? You got to be careful. Yes? Any questions for Jeffrey? Can tell us that getting close to the end of the day, everybody's sitting quietly in their seats. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Excellent overview. Thank you very you much. Doing? That's awesome. <laughs> oh, what's the? Um, I was going to ask, what do, you, what do you use for MDN? Um, I use smart people, <laughs> and the and what I'm the reason I'm answering the question that way. A couple of things I'm going to do. I'm not going to tell you the name of everything we run. I wouldn't be prudent. The other thing is, I don't know the name of everything we run. So I go to John, and I go to Robert, and I say, we've got this initiative coming down. What do we need to do? All right. Go up on stage. So mobile device management. Um, hi, I'm back. Mobile device management is controlled by a product that we got from a network vendor. And it, um, it looks at the connection, it looks at the MAC address, it looks at the type of activity, and it basically says, now I'll tell you what we're about to start using for iPads, and that's going to be Jamf. If you've ever tried to manage iPads in an enterprise, it took us like two months to find them all. With Jamf, we can find them all and then we can wipe them if we need to. So I know that didn't answer your question. All right, thank you very much. One more time for Jeffrey.